Maria Amparo Escadon is the author of the number one LA Times bestseller, Esperanza's Box of Saints and Gonzalez and Daughter Trunking, Trucking Company, named a writer to watch by both Newsweek and the LA Times. She was born in Mexico City and has lived in LA for nearly four decades. Tonight, she'll be in conversation with Jorge Ramos, who is an Emmy award-winning journalist, syndicated columnist, and the author of 10 books. And I hear even before his, maybe 11. Ramos has been the anchor man for the Noticero Univision since 1986. He also hosts the weekly show America with Jorge Ramos. In 2017, he was awarded the Walter Cronkite Award in the US and the Gabriel Garcia Marquez Prize in Colombia for his excellent in, in journalism. We can't wait to hear how you two are connected and why you're in conversation tonight. Um, without further ado, I'm going to let you guys take it away. So enjoy the event, and we look forward to hearing from both of you. Thank you so Very much, much. Patty. Thank you. Maria Amparito, ¿cómo estás? Hola, ¿cómo estás, querido? <laughs> yeah. You know, let, let, let me tell everyone that this is an experiment for you, Maria Amparo, and, and for me. I've known Maria Amparo 40 years almost, I think so. And, and I think... Is this going to be the first time that we talk to each other in English? I think so. Oh, yeah, probably. And maybe, we, yeah. <laughs> so, so let me just start with, with the basic. Let me start directly with LA Weather, Maria Amparo, and, and ask you um, if you, wh why did you write it in English? When I, when I read that, I was, I, was, I was truly surprised. I thought you were going to write everything in Spanish and then find a beautiful translator and then and do it. But but you decided to do it otherwise, why? Well, I've been doing that since the beginning. Uh, when, uh, when I immigrated to the US in the early 80s, I really wanted to learn English and, um, and writing directly in English was something that I set myself out to do, to practice my English and to learn. And I, and I have learned with my first novel, I really struggled with, you know, I, you know, I couldn't go a page without checking the dictionary, the thesaurus. My second novel was a lot easier. And this novel, LA Weather, it was a lot more, you know, smooth at, as far as, um, you know, uh, as far as the language is concerned. Of course, I still struggle. Uh, but that's what the dictionaries are for. And now with technology, you know, you can uh, find words and meanings and uh, homonyms and all that very easily. So it's been wonderful. And I have done my own translations into Spanish of all three books. So you do the, the, their own translation. Isn't that incredibly complicated just to translate yourself? Well, uh, you know what? literal? So What's tricky about it is, you know, I sometimes get carried away and I have to stop myself and say, no, 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 wait, this is not in the, in the English version, you know. <laughs> so I have to sort of control myself and stick to the text. But at the same time, um, I try not to do a literal translation. Uh, so um, I do what I call a transcreation, which is you know, basically taking the concept and um, and taking it, you know, in an interpreta interpretative way. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. For instance, in the novel, LA Weather, there is a passage where uh, Kayla goes to visit uh, her parents' graves at uh, the cemetery in Mexico. And in that same cemetery, um, a Pedro Infante is buried. And in the English version, I say Pedro Infante, the great Mexican mu mu music idol. Um, but in the Spanish version, I don't say that because everybody knows who is Pedro Infante. It's like, you know, so I say Pedro Infante's grave and, and stop, you know, I don't, don't have to explain people who he is. And because everyone who speaks Spanish, of course, has heard of Pedro Infante. He's, he's like uh, the Elvis Presley or, you know, you, you can't explain who is Elvis Presley, you know. <laughs> so that's what I mean by doing a transcreation. You know, I, uh, I think about the culture and I think about uh, the readers. And, um, 
you know, that is something that probably uh, just a regular translator wouldn't feel free to do. Whereas it's my own text, I do it. Now, uh, as a journalist, I'm, my, my responsibility is to report reality as it is, not as I wish it would be. And I wonder for you as a novelist, how, how do you write? I, I, for instance, when, when I write, I write about the things that I see. But do you write about the things that you, that you see or, or you just use reality and then transform it any way you want it? Well, this is a very interesting question, Jorge. Um, I did uh, try to write nonfiction and uh, it was very hard for me because I started making things up. And I realized, you know, I would never be able to be a journalist. <laughs> so here we are on opposite sides of, you know, of the writing business where, you know, you write reality, what you see, and I write what's in my head uh, and how I see the world, but seen through the prism of my own imagination. And uh, that's, that's what fiction is. So you know, rather than looking through a telescope uh, into the world, what I do is I look through a kaleidoscope. You know, it's uh, distorted and different and colorful and um, lends itself for all kinds of personal interpretations. It's very subjective. And so uh, I think that's why I can't write nonfiction. I have a hard time, I've tried it. <laughs> Okay, but, but, but what you're saying is interesting. I, I do understand when you are creating fiction, but for instance, a, a constant in the, in the reviews, and, and they have been fantastic for, for the book, for LA Weather, almost everyone mentions the fact that you are a pretty sophisticated um, observant of reality, and that the Latino community that you are presenting in your books, and especially this one, LA Weather, it is not, stereotypical. It is not Mexicans in LA, Puerto Ricans in New York, and Cubans in, in Miami. They are incredibly sophisticated and, uh, in the way you present it. So how much are you the journalist and how much are you the novelist uh, creating fiction? Well, um, okay. That, man, you're really throwing these really interesting questions. <laughs> Okay, so... I do this for a living. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I remember now. <laughs> well, the thing is, um, as a writer, I only have uh, two sources of information. I have experience and I have reference. Those are my two sources of information. Experience is what I live, what I experience in my own life, what I, what I see personally, what I, what I smell, what I touch, what I, you know, talk to people myself. And then reference is what happens to other people, whether, you know, it's, 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 it's the, it's the, the weather, it's a, a news article, a, a gossip I heard, something that happened to my cousin, uh, something that is, uh, you know, uh, something that somebody tells me. And so that's the reference. But um, I am, a, and you're right, I am a student of uh, the culture around me, a constant and perpetual student. I, I love to observe people. Um, you know, uh, eavesdrop in restaurants, see what the people in the next table are talking about, you know. Uh, I always um, listen very much and I observe and I use my senses because that's what I have, my windows, uh, you know, I, I see things, I always describe colors. Uh, I promise myself never, never, never in a book say a tree, you know, what is it? A sycamore, a palm tree, a, a, you know, they have names, they are different. So there's hundreds of names for trees. So I am very specific about what I observe and very specific about smells and 
and textures. Uh, so I'm very sensorial. Uh, so that really helps me when I, uh, when I describe. And the same thing goes for, for people. You know, I really study people uh, and pass them through the sieve of my imagination and create uh, characters. Character, the characters are not based on a specific person. They're usually composites of people that I encounter in my life, whether they're, you know, close relatives or people passing on the street, uh, but they're composites of these, these people and even a little bit of me in every character. And I'm happy to, to, to hear that I'm not the only one who listens to to somebody else on another <laughs> on another table in a, in a restaurant <laughs> you know what happens on i've been doing a newscast for so long that i'm so used to using the the ifb uh and 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 therefore i have the ability to listen to two conversations and actually follow two conversations at the same time the one i'm having with you and then sometimes probably the producer is just talking to me and uh, in my ear to tell me wh what to do and what's next but um so I'm glad that you do that too. And I'm not uh, el, el raro doing that. <laughs> yeah, no, so, so, no so we're both raros. <laughs> los, dos, los dos raritos. There you go. Okay, so let me, let me get directly into the book. You could have thought of many different subjects, but to talk about the LA weather, when, when I think of the LA weather, again, it's just the most basic idea but it's always sunny, it's always 70 something, nothing happens. And then you decided to create a, a, a novel precisely on that, on, on that false statement, right? Yes, uh, and it is a false statement. Um, and I realized this because when I was living in LA, I wasn't paying much attention to the weather. It was always here, you know, but, uh, but I did live in, in New York, um, for uh, uh, four years. And I did encounter people in New York who told me very self-assured, there's no weather in LA. And I said, what are you talking about? What about the fires, the Santana winds, the, you know, there's all kinds, there's five seasons, the Jacaranda season, there's the, um, the drought, the floods, uh, el niño, la niña, la nada, you know, you, you go on and on and on. I mean, and, and sure, there are seasons. And I'm not talking about a war season, which we have. I'm talking about, you know, real weather seasons. And so I wanted to prove them wrong. And I said, you know, I'm going to write a, a book about LA, but it, it's going to be, the weather is going to be the backdrop, but at the same time, my characters are going to be experiencing the effects of the weather in, in real time and in, and in their own skin, you know, because uh, when we talk about climate change, we always think 2050, you know, oh, it's going to happen in 2050. No, it's happening now. And we're already seeing, we're already seeing the effects. I mean, the, the recent flood in New York and uh, the fires around around Los Angeles and South, Southern California in Tahoe. There is just a huge fire right now. So we are we are experiencing uh, it. So I wanted my characters to experience that, but I wanted to make the story more of a family story and their interactions between them. You know, which I think is is the most fun part. You know, just how they deal with all the stuff I throw at them. So, so of course you, there's climate change in, in the novel, but the, the real interesting thing is what happens in, with Los Alvarado. Exactly. You know? yeah. With Kayla con Oscar and, and, and all of them. So are they your family now? Do you live with them as ghosts? Do you, how, many, how many years did it take you to, um, to create this family? And I wonder if you can let them go now. Well, I started writing it in, in 2016. The novel takes place in 2016. Uh, it's actually a year in the life, starting in January, ending in December. Uh, and I actually, all the weather events in the, in the, in the book are real. So, Except for one. 
just one. <laughs> the last one, there's a rain that really didn't happen, but I wanted it to rain uh, in yeah. Christmas. <laughs> it never rains in California. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but the characters I, I find are like like your children. You know, you 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 can never say goodbye to them. You know, they uh, they keep popping up. You know, and uh, following you around, and uh, you think about them in different ways. Uh, I think uh, I've just been accumulating characters, uh, but um, it's hard to let them go. Of course, what, now that they're in a, a book, there's no change. They're they're done. But in that, in that capacity, they remain uh, very present in my life. So, so what was the idea with Los Alvarados? What, what did you want to, to show? What was the, the intention? Well, I wanted to, I wanted to create a, a Latino family uh, that is closer to what, to, to my family, you know, uh, uh, my, 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 my spouse's family is Jewish, but they're Mexican, you know, so um, it, it's very rare to find a, a novel where you encounter uh, a Jewish a Mexican living in the U.S. And I think that that's uh, a very interesting diaspora of the diaspora of the diaspora. Uh, so uh, I really wanted to include uh, a, a Jewish character, which is Kayla, but they are a mixed marriage because Oscar is uh, Catholic. And so, but uh, he, he's not an immigrant. Um, he didn't cross the border, the border crossed him. The family Alvarado, they had been in California since before um, California uh, was part of the US since it was part of Mexico. And I did want to have a family like that in, in the book. And so by putting together these two people, you know, I created um, a, a somewhat a unique family, but we're not unique uh, in many ways. You know, we're, we're Latinos, we speak Spanish, we listen to Juan Gabriel, <laughs> I mean, we, we uh, you know, we eat chilaquiles, uh, kosher chilaquiles, of course. Uh, but you see, so I, I really wanted to describe a family that I haven't seen in in novels before. So uh, let me let, make, let me make a pause and, and ask you about the, the Latino community right now and how do you see it when when you and I arrive in Los Angeles? I arrived in 1980. Three, how about you? The same year. <laughs> okay. It was, it was 1983. And if we have time and courage, we'll, we'll tell them how we, how we met and, <laughs> and what happened those years in El Teatro Fiesta in, in yes. downtown Lo Los Angeles. But when we arrived at Maria Amparo, there were only 15 million Latinos in the United States, 15. And, and we just saw the, the latest numbers from, from the Census Bureau. And we are 62, and I'm guessing it's more like 65 or close to, to 70. My gosh. Have you, how, how, tell me, have you seen this Hola Latina? How, how it has affected you and how it has affected the way that you, that you write? Are you writing about those Latinos that were maybe invisible and silent in the 1980s that we saw, or the new empowered Latinos that really want to take power now? The novel talks about em empowered Latinos. Uh, these are professionals, uh, la the three sisters, you know, one is a famous chef, the other one is uh, an architect. Um, uh, the, the youngest one is a social media guru. Uh, the parents have their careers. Um, uh, they're well off, uh, but... <laughs> That's one of the topics I'm not going to discuss because I don't okay. want to give away a spoiler, but, <laughs> but that can change. Um, and so it's, it's, it's this new Latino that is, um, you know, a, acculturated, but at the same time, very proud to be Latino, who speaks Spanish, who... Um, 
listens to uh, Latin music, who hangs around with other Latinos, who is a professional, uh, who is successful. And that's, that's the, the, the Latino I wanted to portray. Um, I think that we've come a long way uh, from, you know, the early days when I had to beg advertisers to advertise in Spanish. Now they want to do it. You don't have to sell them the market because the market has an incredible buying power. If Latino America were a country, it would be the richest Spanish speaking country in the world. And so, you know, we do have a lot of power. Now, are, are we, do you, do you notice an identity problem? I, I still remember many years ago, and maybe you don't remember that, but I, I, was, I was trying to identify myself because I was in the process of becoming a U.S. citizen. And I told you, I, I think I told you that I had lived 25 years in Mexico. And of course, I'm a Mexican citizen, but I waited another 25 years in the United States to become a U.S. citizen. And it is beautiful. It is really a beautiful process when, when the country that you choose chooses you back. It, is, it, it was a very emotional, important moment. And I can safely say um, that I'm Mexican-American or American-Mexican, and that's perfectly fine. But I remember asking you, and then you said, well, for me, it's very simple. I am a Mexican living in the United States. So before, before I ask about you, and I'll get get to that. Tell me about your characters. Are they conflicted? Are they Mexican and American? Are they Latinos? Are they Hispanic? Are they Latinx? Are they more Mexican than, than Americans? What are they? Um, I think they reflect a little bit of my own identity. Um, maybe not so much uh, Oscar, because he was born here, he, his family was born here, his ancestors were born here, he's from here, from California. Uh, whereas uh, Kayla, she immigrates to get married, um, to get married to Oscar. And so she is truly Mexican, 100% Mexican. And it takes, it, it, it's really hard for her to adapt as a mother. And this, I went through that uh, when my kids were little in school. I didn't know that I had to volunteer at the carnival. What is that? My parents didn't even know where my school was in Mexico, you know? And here I am having to volunteer at the carnival, do this, do that. I mean, a lot of things that parents in Mexico are not familiar with, let alone people who cannot speak the language yet. And then, you know, the school sends them bulletins and things, you know, and, and they just don't know how to, um, how to coordinate the, their education at home with the education at school. Uh, and so I'm talking about all kinds of immigrants, of course, no? but uh, in the novel, um, she is obviously um, uh, good at speaking English um, and, and, and she is acculturated and adapted but she still has a hard time. When, when her daughters announced they're, they're going to college uh, in New York and in Miami, she's devastated because she wants her kids to live with her forever. You know, that's very Mexican. And so she has a hard time with that. How do you identify yourself now? Well, I was, are you? I, I, I'm, I'm like Kayla in the sense that uh, I feel American and I think I am acculturated and I, consider myself an amphibian creature that I can go back and forth between the two cultures. Um, but I do recognize that I have this thing with motherhood because uh, I think I'm more of a Mexican mother than an American mother. And so, um, you know, my kids, <laughs> I've put my kids through some stuff, you know, just for being a Mexican mother. <laughs> they will attest to that. but. Uh, but as far as my professional life, I feel very American. And so it's interesting that you use the word amphibian because mm -hmm. Sandra Cisneros uses that a lot. Oh. Um, and, and saying that we live, and now Sandra Cisneros, as you know, she's living in, in San Miguel de Allende after living for so many years in Chicago and in San Antonio. So mm -hmm. 
what, what's interesting for, for amphibians like you and me and, and Sandra is that I, I think sometimes we are translators too, from one community to the other, from one language uh, to the other. And, and, and I wanted to ask you, when you go back to Mexico, do people tell you, you're not from Mexico, go back to the United States. And here in the United States, have someone told you, go back to your country, go back to Mexico? Um, not at all. I just jump right back into the Mexican culture, very smooth and easy. In Mexico. Um, in Mexico. And here, um, I don't know, I've been lucky. I never felt, you know, or, or I've never, nobody's ever told me, I know they've told you, but <laughs> no. <laughs> Donald Trump told me. I know. I go, know. Go back. Go back to Univision. He really yeah. Go back. Go back to Mexico, right? Yeah, exactly. But 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 uh, um, no, I I had never never had anybody tell me go back to your country or go back to Mexico or any of that. Uh, and I I have been lucky because I know uh, there is a lot of that, uh, you know. Can I ask you about accents? How do you handle accents in, in a novel? People watching us and listening to us, they're saying, estos nunca aprendieron inglés, no? <laughs> <laughs> they might be saying, what are those accents? I mean, you've been, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, they might be saying, you guys have been living in this country for almost 40 years. Come on, just get rid of that accent. How do you handle that accent in your novels? And how do you translate that experience uh, in the written world? I, 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 I would find it incredibly difficult. I have a hard time. I, as much as I have a hard time in, with myself, with my accent, because it is, it is uh, you know, pretty bad. But in, in, in writing, um, it can get tedious, you know? If, if I start tweaking the words, to make them sound like, you know, uh, after a little while, it starts getting tedious when you read. So I try not to, not to use it a lot. I try to describe their identity as somebody from a different country uh, by their actions and by what they think and what they do, um, rather than how they say it, you know, so... Uh, in Esperanza's Box of Saints, my first novel, um, Esperanza um, uh, immigrates to the U.S. Looking, looking for her daughter, and she doesn't even speak English. So basically, I just kept a very basic English in her dialogue. Um, here in L.A. weather, it's different because Oscar... Uh, He's not very good with Spanish. Uh, so he's more of an American guy. And uh, the three sisters, the daughters are born here. So they are bilingual, but uh, they're bilingual like my kids are bilingual, which is they speak perfect, perfect Spanish, but with a little accent. So it's the other way around. So it's very interesting how you, how you, you know, you ask the question, yes, uh, to handle accents in the written form is very difficult. So just for the people who are listening at the end of the conversation, and we're going to be talking for another 20 minutes, half an hour at the end of the conversations, if you have questions, send them to us and then I'll ask them to, to Maria Amparo. I, I want to do a transition so I can ask you about your LA experience, but, but before that, would you mind, I know it's never done at this moment, but do you mind reading something from your book? Do you have it, by the way, with you? Yes, 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 I do. I do. I have is there, is there a, a page or a, we, we hadn't planned this, so I can give you a few, a few seconds just to look out for, for something, but something that yeah. you would want us to, to read I, or listen to. Yes, I am going to show you, okay. Oh, okay. So <clears throat> this is a, a Patricia um, passage. Patricia is the youngest of the sisters. Uh, she's 28 and uh, she has a teenage son uh, from, uh, from a, a rape. And she lives with her parents 
and she's married to uh, a French guy, Eric, who lives in San Francisco, and they meet up every weekend. And um, so this is this is her, um, Patricia. Patricia. So after she dropped off her sisters and called her office to request a flex day of work, Patricia drove to Eagle Rock in Topanga. She'd hiked the Mosh Trail many times before and knew she'd have a decent phone signal in case Oscar tried to reach her. This was the birthday gift she wanted, to spend this perfect 72 degree day by herself, walking among chaparral and sagebrush, admiring the Santa Monica mountains in the distance and thinking hard about the stage of things among the Alvarados. As her legs negotiated the uneven and sometimes dodgy climb along the dirt paths, her mind kept going back to a single question. How had her family become so disconnected? She remembered the days when everyone knew where everybody else was, what everybody was doing. Every year, color-coded calendars were posted on the fridge and were updated daily by all involved. A tin can with markers sat on a countertop. Yellow for Oscar, green for Kayla, blue for Claudia, pink for Olivia, red for Patricia, orange for Daniel, and black for family events. It was all there, Daniel's chess club and swimming competitions, Kayla's mammograms and gallery openings, Patricia's parties and weekend trips, Oscar's multiple errands around town, Olivia's school presentations, Claudia's marathons birthday parties, quinceañeras, bat mitzvahs, weddings, holidays, vacations, everything was shared. A rhythm, the way the Alvarados moved along the hours and days and weeks of those calendars year after year had served as a thread of sorts that tied her family together. But by the time her older sisters had gone to college in New York and Miami and had gotten married and moved to their respective homes, something had broken. The calendar had ceased to exist years ago. The markers, still in the tin can, had dried up and were now relegated to the top shelf with the sous vide cooker, the ice cream maker, and the creme brulee set still in its original box. Aging undisturbed, it seemed to her that each member of her family was a top spinning on a surface by itself, unencumbered by what the other tops were doing or where they were going. What surprised her the most was the fact that they still met for Sunday family dinners, rain or shine, with or without husbands, with or without the twins. But people sitting at a table don't make a family. Monologues don't make a conversation. Even the most delicious meal meticulously prepared by Kayla didn't inspire anymore. And in the past year, She'd watch her father descend into apathy. She didn't rule out depression, but she was more inclined to believe something was bothering him. Had she done enough to figure out what it was? She thought not, and this upset her. She wished she could pry open his mind and extract his pain, his worry. Or was this deterioration part of the process of aging? She wondered if all families went through this emotional separation as the children grew up and the parents got older. Perhaps she had a heightened sensitivity to what was going on because she lived with Oscar and Kayla and could see the day-to-day -day decline in their care and affection for each other. Why did she live at home anyway? Was she hoping to hang on to the thread of days and weeks that connected her and her parents and sisters in the family calendar? She decided to ask her loyal Twitter tribe, am I suffering a bad case of millennialism? Or am I justified to be comfortably living at my parents' house at 28? Share your thoughts. She posted her tweet, but de deleted it almost immediately, suddenly feeling ashamed of herself at the thought that she might be closer to people she'd never met than to her own blood. Patricia, muchas gracias, my name Bart. That's beautiful. Nada, thank you. All right, so I was going to leave the questions at the end, but there are so many questions, Maria Amparo, that you're gonna to have to help me. Um, short answers, that way we can go through the 11 questions that we have or more. Is that okay? That's perfect. All right. Let's suppose that we have commercial break, so. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the first one is um, Maite Prida, who's congratulating you. And, uh, okay. 
Next question, uh, Federico, do you write the movie scripts of your novels as well? Yes, I do. Um, actually, to write a screenplay based on the novel uh, is very helpful uh, because uh, it's like a dialogue exercise. And I use a lot of the dialogue that I write in the screenplay, I put it into the novel. And it's sort of writing a screenplay makes, uh, it sort of gives me permission to write dialogue in a more colloquial way. And so the, the dialogue in the novel ends up being feeling more natural. Okay, Jose Stepensky, uh, your two first novels were Realismo Magico. Is this one considered creative writing? Well, this one is not, not Realismo Magico. Uh, the first novel was more of a little bit of Realismo Magico. Then I started to sort of drift away from Realismo Magico. Uh, with Gonzalez and Daughter Trucking Company, and now LA Weather is is more realistic, more contemporary. Federico Trager, how often do you write? Uh, whoa, whenever I can, but I don't really have a schedule. I, you know, could be in the, preferably in the morning, uh, but if there is a morning that I, you know, just don't feel like it, I, I don't write. Um, with LA, another question, with LA Weather, did you go Gonzo style riding? Like when you went with uh, trucking with Gonzalez and daughter? Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, with Gonzalez and daughter, a trucking company, I did uh, travel around with truck drivers uh, for a year uh, on and off. Uh, and um, with uh, LA weather, I just uh, did what Oscar did, go to as many neighborhoods in LA as possible and walk around. Uh, I also went to Central Valley, uh, where is our California cornucopia of uh, vegetables and fruits and almonds. And uh, uh, I took a lot of pictures and we drove uh, by with my, my husband and, and took a lot of pictures and just saw the, the scenery. It's just incredible. Uh, we did go to uh, the, the, the aftermath of a fire uh, near Napa um, and uh, toured it and also took a lot of pictures. And uh, I also um, researched the weather, uh, mm -hmm. but that I did it in my computer. And uh, I just went back and checked every day during 2016, what the weather was like in LA. Did it rain? Was there a drought? Was there a fire? Was there, um, you know, a heat wave? You know, all of that is in the novel. Every, every entry of every date, um, you know, if was it a full moon? You know, I write about that. So I did kind of go gone so <laughs> Do you have a, a favorite weather channel or person? Uh, not really. I mean, it used to be my dad because um, he lived in Mexico and I lived in LA and he would call me and tell me, um, take an umbrella, it's going to rain. <laughs> <laughs> he was my weatherman, <laughs> but I don't have my dad anymore. So I just research it, um, you know, on, I just Google it. Quick questions. Do you consider yourself an Angelina? Yes. 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 Oh, yeah. Tú eres de Los Ángeles. De corazón, yes. Okay. Uh, Madariaga, can you talk about frijol wood? Or no, do you talk about frijol wood in this book? Ah, okay. So frijol wood was uh, a group of Mexican professionals working in the movies. And so um, there was makeup artists, uh, sound people, DPs, you know, uh, film people, screenwriters. I was a, a originally the original group. I was a member and we used to have parties uh, oftentimes and we were called, we would call ourselves Free Hollywood. Um, but that organization has sort of faded away. And uh, now there's so many people working in film uh, who are of Mexican descent or who are Mexicans uh, behind the camera, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, there's an interesting question from Julio Herrera. How is, this is going to take you a little longer. How is the Mexican concept of love 
different from developed countries or Anglo-Saxon law? <laughs> Julio! <laughs> oh my goodness, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Well, um... I mean, we are, we, we are known, uh, you know, Mexican people, we are known to be very passionate. And so for us, the concept of love is, involves possession and involves jealousy and involves, you know, all kinds of feelings, you know. Um, uh, whereas in other parts of the world, you know, it may be a little more phlegmatic, more, you know, uh, cerebral, I would say. But I think it really depends on the person, you know. Um, Pedro, my my husband, has been reading about uh, poets, Russian poets in the 20th century, and how they, you, you know, uh, worked around the uh, the regime, and uh, they were very passionate as well. So you know, some countries, you know, we tend to be more more passionate, or at least show our our feelings more. Sergio Arau dice, gracias por pintarnos como seres inteligentes y creativos. Eh, Leticia te pregunta, ¿cuál es el autor que más te ha influido en la forma de escribir? Which author has influenced the way of, your way of writing the most? Well, I'm a huge fan of Gabriel García Márquez, but I, you know, I, I know I could never write like him. So it's just something I dream, but uh, I... But I think he has inspired me very much ever since I was a teenager when I was reading his books and I kept saying, you know, I want to do this. I want to tell stories. And I think uh, he, he, he never knew this, of course, but <laughs> I think he was a huge influence in, in, in me. Have you read, by the way, I, I just finished reading Rodrigo Garcia's uh, book on his, um, his parents. Uh, is, La Despedida, Gabo y Mercedes. It, it's a beautiful book, beautiful. but so strong. So it, it's, a, it's a combination. It, it's an incredible book. Very powerful, yeah. very, um, you know, written with, with, with the heart in his, in his hands. You know, I think that uh, Rodrigo did an amazing job. I read it also. And, and um, I had to text him and say, Rodrigo, I'm crying. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I, I talked to him a few weeks ago and, and I was also very moved. Um, rápido, Maru Pinto, felicidades. ¿Ya estás haciendo un script para la película? Are you writing already the script for the movie? Uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm right. I'm thinking about it. Uh, I think I, I would like to, to do a, a TV series. That would be fantastic. And I think it does lend itself for a TV series. And, uh, uh, but I, no, I haven't started. Okay, you're going to like this one. Mari Navarro, ¿te acuerdas de ella? Uh -huh. said, Congratulations, Maria. I knew you when you were 12 and you spoke very little English back in the seventh grade in Minnesota. What were you doing in Minnesota? Anyway, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm so proud of you, writes Maria, and your accomplishments. Congratulations to my dearest lifelong friend. Well, Mary taught me a lot of English uh, because when I moved, I, I went as an exchange student uh, to Minnesota when I was 12 and, um, and I learned uh, English there. And then when I came home, I thought I had mastered the English language because I had spent a whole year with my friend Mary and my other friends from Minnesota. And it wasn't until I came back to the States to Los Angeles when I was, uh, you know, 24, that I realized that, yeah, I mastered English, but as a 13 year old, I knew all the words, cool, neat, weird, <laughs> you know, <laughs> gross. <laughs> but of course my vocabulary was very, very, very uh, scarce and I had to learn a lot. And I, I'm still learning, <laughs> I'm still learning, but I am very grateful to, to Mary and to all my friends in, um, in middle school or is that high school? No, it must be middle school, seventh grade, right? Yeah. Yeah. Eh, Juan Pablo, felicidades, María Amparo. Interesting question. Do you find it easier to write from the perspective of your female characters than from that of males, given your own experience? Is your writing, in that sense, somewhat autobiographical? Ah, Juan Pablo, good question. Um, 
at first when I started to write as a teenager in Mexico, I was fascinated by all the Latin American writers, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, Juan Rulfo, Octavio Paz, Carlos Fuentes, Mario Benedetti, Julio Cortázar, you get the idea? All men, all men. So I thought, you know, to be a writer, you have to write like a man. So all my early work, I write, I wrote, and I go back and read my short stories from when I was a teenager, and they all from the point of view of a man, uh, the characters are men, you know, um, fascinating. And then when I got here and I started walking around the huge bookstores here in the U.S. and going to public libraries, which is something we don't have uh, in Mexico City um, as much, I realized that there were a lot of women writers, you know, and so Maya Angelou and I mean, just way too many. And I said, oh, so I can write from the female perspective. This is cool. And, and, and it just opened up the gates for me. I, I discovered that I could, you know, write as a woman. And um, the experience, of course, was very helpful because now my, my male characters, you know, I have a lot of practice uh, and I can totally impersonate, you know, um, the male perspective from my, you know, early upbringing. There are a few more questions, but, but I want to, to end the conversation asking you a little more personal questions. Uh, I just finished reading the book by Sandra Cisneros, Martita, te recuerdo, Martita, I remember you. Mm -hmm. and, the, the out, and right at the beginning of the book, Maria Amparo, uh, she writes, uh, Sandra Cisneros, vive de su pluma. Um, the translation would be that, that she can actually get her living through writing, no? Can you say the same? No, not at this point. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I consider myself a professional writer. I have gotten paid very well and everything, but uh, at this point in my life, uh, not yet. I, okay. I'm hoping to do that. I'm hoping to live off my, my pen, <laughs> like Sandra. That would be awesome. <laughs> So, so let, me, let me finish with the last few minutes of the conversation asking you about your LA experience. Can, can you tell people who don't know you how you got to LA and where, where do you live in the first few months? And, and... <laughs> you know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I arrived in 1983 with my boyfriend who I married the next year and had my kids with him. Uh, we came to start an advertising agency. We thought that, you know, why not? You know, we didn't have any money. We didn't have any credit. We had no clients. We had no, um, you know, experience. But why not, right? And so, 1983 in Los Angeles. 1983. So when, when you're young and a little bit of arrogance, a little bit of ignorance, and you think you can do it all. Nobody's told you you cannot do it. And so you do it, right? So we did it. So we arrived and um, we had no money. So a, a friend of uh, my boyfriend who had gone to college with him, uh, his father owned a porn theater in downtown LA in the Pico Union uh, yes. district. And and he was very kind. He said, you know, you can live there, you know, for now until, you know, you start making some money and you can rent an apartment, but you can stay there upstairs. There's a little room in the projector room and, you know, and so we, we went there and manning the ticket office was uh, <laughs> my dear friend, Jorge Ramos. <laughs> So we go back. I also needed a job. I needed a job. I needed to get some money. Well, you were a student. You eras estudiambre. Exactly. <laughs> so we always hung out there, and it was actually a wonderful time uh, where we learned a lot. Uh, we had nothing, but uh, we created something out of nothing, all of us, and uh, that was an amazing experience. Um, 
obviously with time the agency grew uh, at first uh, it was uh, it was all commercials in spanish but we had to convince the the brand to advertise in spanish because they had we were invisible uh, but later as we fought you know and fought and fought for presence uh, they started to notice and they started to look at the numbers and they realized, you know, what a powerful, um, what a powerful uh, uh, demographics uh, we were. And so um, and that, that's, that was my, my early days at the Teatro Fiesta. Did you, did you plan of going back to Mexico? Because as an immigrant, I'm, I'm still looking for home. I'm still looking for the for something that I can call home. I, and I created a home for my kids, for Paola and Nicolás. But um, sometimes I find myself that I'm not neither from here or from, from Mexico. Are you still looking for home? Are you still trying to create that home? Uh, no, I think, I've, I think I'm home. Uh, I think I'm home. I mean, uh, Los Angeles has been very generous with me and uh, Somebody said somebody said the other day uh, that LA is my adopted city, and I I, I cringed. I said no, it's my city. <laughs> I'm not adopted, you know. But I do I do love Mexico, and I do feel Mexican. And rather than not feeling from here or there, uh, I feel from that I'm from both sides. Um, so I can say confidently that my home is where I am, either LA or Mexico. And, and this book, no, no question about it. It's in, in a way, it's a, a love letter to Los Angeles. No? It, it is. It, it is a, a thank you for embracing me. No, thank yes. you for giving me my my place. Indeed, it is. <laughs> And but it's been a it's been a pleasure. I haven't seen you in I don't know how many years, but I I always remember those years in Los Angeles, and it, it, they were amazing. And I'm so proud of you for the for this novel. It's gonna well, do great. You must come and visit. You know, I will. I will. But not for work because you're usually following disasters. I know. I know. I just... <laughs> come for vacation. <laughs> Te mando un abrazo. I want to thank you both so much. Please, uh, the link is still up. Please purchase your copy of LA Weather. It's terrific. I actually read it yesterday in one sitting because I have the arc here. So it just it just captures you. And what a delightful conversation. Thank you so much. Lots of luck to both of you. And um, thank you for joining RJ Julius tonight. Good luck. Thank you, Patty. And thank, thank you so much, Jorge. Thank Bye. you. So Thank you. Oh, hey, you were terrific. Thanks so much. All right. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye.